Hey gang, welcome back for another video here on Joe Chem. All right, so this video is gonna be relatively short because although this concept is new, I don't think it's terribly awful even though the mechanism can be a bit weird at first, but this problem can really manifest, or this type of concept, decarboxylation, can really manifest itself in most frequently a complete the reaction question and I've never seen it, but I think it's also a pretty good theory question because I think the reason why it happens is pretty cool and it does involve a lot of organic two principles. But enough of me yapping, let's get a drawn. Okay, so what is decarboxylation? Decarboxylation is actually when you have a structure and there's a rearrangement that occurs and some of the structure, some of the carbons in your molecule pieces out and leaves as CO2 gas. That's right, you're gonna lose some atoms and CO2 gas will be given off. So it's honestly pretty cool. Let me just show you. So let's, uh, and this typically happens, this will happen uh, when you have the setup of an R group, carbonyl, something like this. So you gotta have a carboxylic acid and a 1,3 dicarbonyl. So you're gonna need, you know, some type of carbonyl presence and then a carboxylic acid terminating your chain. Okay? Uh, anyways, so what do we got right here? So we do have an ester, you know, we have a keto ester here, right? Uh, a beta keto ester, rather, right? We'll, be, we'll use our smart person words. Beta keto ester, okay? So in the first two, the first step right here, we just have some sodium hydroxide in water. Now, when in this problem, this could be, obviously these are basic conditions, right? I could have easily used acidic conditions, but going with base here. What is this is going to do is going to perform some ester hydrolysis. We're just going to pretty much, whatever ester we're dealing with, we're going to wipe it away and just transform our ester into a carboxylic acid. If you need a refresher on that, I would highly recommend uh, going back to the carboxylic acid derivatives section of Geochem and checking out ester hydrolysis. So, but I'll draw, I'll draw the mechanism here. So what's going to happen here is we have our beta keto ester enter in our friend hydroxide. Hydroxide is going to be enamored with the carbonyl in the ester and it will attack the carbonyl carbon. These electrons are going to kick up, forming a wonderful tetrahedral intermediate, which we are all too familiar with by this point. I'm gonna draw my new OH, or my O minus over here. I'm gonna leave this ester section down here, and my newly added OH up top, right? Tetrahedral intermediate. It's not gonna stick around that long. It's going to collapse. Who's gonna go? Well. Obviously, we can have some forwards and backwards here. This is truly more of a equilibrium arrow. And we're actually going to kick off our ester piece, or sorry, like the ether piece of that once was part of our ester. Okay, so now you see where carboxylic acid comes from. Well, obviously ethoxide wasn't a great leaving group. Ethoxide's not that satisfied. Ethoxide will come back and demand something it could attack and it could send this thing backwards, but what will finish this and bring it forwards is the fact that it will be quenched. It will just deprotonate the, the carboxylic acid and we will end up with a carboxylate terminating our chain, right? Just the conjugate base of our con uh, carboxylic acid. Well, that is step one, ladies and germs. And luckily, right, in step two, we're just gonna dump a whole bunch of sulfuric acid in here. So this negative charge quickly goes away. Abbreviating sulfuric acid right here. We're gonna quench the negative charge. It's gonna get protonated. There's a whole bunch of acid floating around. Don't think we don't have a whole lot. Okay, there we go. So it's at this point that we are ready for our decarboxylation, right? We have our setup here with our carbonyl and our uh, carboxylic acid separated by three positions, okay? So what's gonna happen here, and I'm gonna redraw this. This doesn't, 
affect anything with the chemistry. We have the structure, but the structure is the, gonna, the molecule is going to reposition itself. And I'm going to explain why. So really, no change here. I'm just going to redraw this. I'm not even drawing resonance. I'm just drawing it in a different confirmation that the structure will adhere, adhere to. Uh, hold on, of course now. Okay, there we go. So one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, there we go, got the structure. Okay, so why I drew it like this is because one, two, three, four, five, and six. When you have this setup with your carbonyl and the carboxylic acid, being separated by three positions, the structure likes to reposition itself to mimic a six-membered ring. And why that does it is because twofold. There's a little bit of uh, coordination going on here. This oxygen, that hydrogen, they're talking to each other, they're having a good time, and in fact, when you have this scenario, it mimics a six-membered ring, but not only that, we do have some sp2 characters in this mix, it mimics some aromatic char uh, character, not complete, but some, and that's stabilizing. So you get this coordination, and here's what actually happens. This oxygen takes one of the double bond, the, the electron pairs in this double bond, and it actually grabs the hydrogen. Just, sorry, it grabs the proton, not the hydrogen. No electrons come along, grabs the H. At that point, these bonds right here they come over and they form a carbon-oxygen double bond. And if you know the structure of CO2, you can see we're basically achieving this because we already have this carbon double bonded here. We have to avoid breaking the octet rule. So what finishes the decarboxylation and what cleaves a bond is this bond's got to go somewhere. We actually jump this over here. So you see kind of a lot of cyclic arrow moves. So I'm going to... So you can see that the one, two, three right here, it's actually leaving because the, this is the bond that's holding everything together, the bond between three and four, and that's breaking. So we do get CO2 going up in the air, and what we're left with is this, right? One, two, three, double bond here, single bond here, OH. And I hope that you're seeing, aha, this is an enol. This is going to immediately flip. It's going to tautomer to its keto form. So we get CO2 and we get a ketone. So really, when you do a decarboxylation, if I was doing this problem on a complete the reaction section, I would look, I would see my first step. I see I have an ester, right? Not ready for decarboxylation. I know I need carbonyl, one, two, three, carboxylic acid. So my first step, I know I get this. Okay, so the first step, right, we do have this. Second step, I know this is going to get protonated up to this at first. And your dead giveaway for decarboxylations once you achieve this is the heat. Once you crank up the oven, once you crank up the temperature, the decarboxylation happens. That rearrangement the structural rearrangement, and then the actual bond rearrangement occurs. So it's at this point, you basically just have to cleave off your carboxylic acid, obviously knowing that you go through an enol intermediate, right? You end up with this, which then flips directly to this, plus CO2. Okay, gang? So remember, this intermediate is very stable because of the six-membered ring. It resembles as well as the fact that it resembles some aromaticity. So it's stable, and then all of a sudden, the heat makes everything go crazy. So let's do one more example, and we'll call it a video. Okay, gang, one more example, and then let's close the book on decarboxylation. All right, so if we look here, I got some inspiration. I wanted to spice it up a little bit. So, we see we have a uh, beta keto ester, right? Because we see the ester right here, and then alpha beta, got the ketone. Okay, so, you know, we've been doing some cool stuff, so why not put it all together? 
So in this first step, right, we see we have basic conditions, right, uh, methoxide as well as methanol, and we see that's the kind of ether character of our ester. So all we're doing in this first step is a deprotonation of our carbon in between our two carbonyls, right? So if I'm gonna kind of log my progress over here, the first thing, right, is we're just gonna take one of the hydrogens, deprotonate, dumping a lone pair right on this position, making it, you guessed it, nucleophilic, okay? Then, no surprise, is step two, we just enter in something that's ready to be attacked via SN2. This happens to be, if we're gonna throw it back to some of our common naming, sec butyl chloride, right? Because we got butane and we got a chlorine on the secondary position. So all that's gonna happen here attack. So two will be just like this. See my four carbons and I'm attached at this position right there. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and draw some boundaries right here. I'm going to work step three over here. Ah, okay. Now we get to the part of our program where we see hydrolysis conditions for our ester, right? We see we have an ester right here. All this is going to do is attack, go through the tetrahedral intermediate, collapse, and get to our part where we do have a carboxylate, right? So basically what that's gonna look like for us here is we're going to lose our ester character, and I'm drawing things in, well, that was all right, but keep it the same. Okay, that's all that's gonna happen. Okay, step four, right? Step four starts off by protonating our, you know, the O minus up to an H, taking the carboxylate to a carboxylic acid. So let me kind of do 4A. We got this structure. And then, this is not really A and B, but I'm doing it for the sake of Drawing the rearrangement, right? We see because we see heat, we're doing a decarboxylation. Let me draw this a little bit better for us. You and I sometimes take a second to kind of wrap my mind around with how it how it gets is drawn. Uh, one, two, three. Oxygen goes here. H here, right? Because we see the little one, two, three four, five, the fake, the faux, six-membered ring, right? That's going to provide some coordination right here that's going to kind of fake a six-membered ring to fake some aromaticity that provides some stabilization. Temperature goes up, oven turns on, right? That's the heat. We do the rearrangement. So oxygen grabs hydrogen, proton rather. We form CO2 and the bond breaks. So obviously we knew we were going to produce some ga gaseous CO2. And then this is gonna look weird, right? I'm gonna go ahead and draw this up here, just like this. Remember we form an enol. We know it flips to the carbonyl. So even though this isn't drawn like, you know, like a straight chain, like I could draw this a little bit more nicely, but it doesn't matter because everything's connected to the correct place. There you go. That is our product. So if you can wrap your head around this example, you got decarboxylation in the bag. Just be sure to understand how these arrows work so your brain isn't scrambled. And if you're shaky on anything that happened up to here, I would strongly recommend going back, watching some of the videos on uh, like 1,3 dicarbonyls acting as nucleophiles, as well as ester hydrolysis. This is in basic conditions. It can also happen in acidic conditions. And uh, yeah, relive some of the good times, right? Anyways, thanks for tuning into this video on Joe Chem. I'll see you in the next one.